Let's get started. My name is Virginia Harper and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And I have the great pleasure of introducing my dear friend Lauren Kramer, uh, who's here from Boston. And uh, he is there in Boston, the information's up on the board, so make sure you write it down. Uh, Warren is an uh, over 30 year experience uh, macrobiotic counselor and teacher and he travels all around teaching the great message and how to how people take self-responsibility for their health. He visits over nine cities a, throughout the year giving lectures and workshops and we have the great privilege of having him in Nashville to visit us. Plus he loves country music so that helps, right? <laughs> So help me welcome Warren Kramer. Hi everybody, how are we doing? Good. Are you ready to feel like a million bucks? Ready to go? So this lecture is the first of six. And these lectures basically are tools to create dynamic health and a great life. That's really what they are. I mean, if, I, if you pick up even three, four things from the total of all these lectures, I'd be thrilled. And um, I know they make a, a profound difference. I want to share with you um, what came out of the teachers' uh, conference in Berlin in the fall. It was a bunch of, I couldn't make the conference, but it was a big conference with a bunch of macrobiotic teachers and who often have a very difficult time agreeing on things. But I finally came up with a new definition of macrobiotics. And I realize there's probably some of you here that know nothing about macrobiotics, right? Yeah. And so I'd like to at least just take a very few minutes and give you some of the essence so you know what, what this is about. So this new definition of macrobiotics, and that's not microbiotics, it's macro, big or large, okay? So number one, there are two definitions, right? A way of life that guides one's choices in nutrition, activity, and lifestyle. So I'll say it again. A way of life that guides one's choices in nutrition, activity, and lifestyle, okay? Guides one's choices. As we're gonna talk about today in this diagnosis class, creating health and keeping health through our life means really one thing, and it means managing one's condition. Managing, well, I call it your condition, that means your, your being day to day. If you have the ability to do that, generally you can have a pretty good quality, healthy life. Your constitution, you can't change that. Your constitution is your genetic bank account, it's what you're born with. It's basically father's sperm quality, mother's egg quality at the time of conception, those, those nine months or maybe less that you're in the womb, and the first basically year of your life influences your constitution. That actually is at the core of who we are. Can't change that, it's got, it's, you got what you got. Your condition can change incredibly so. Amazing amount, amazing, yeah. That's what we have control over. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't have an idea of how to manage that day to day, and it's a challenge, no doubt. This is, this is my 30th year of practicing macrobiotics, and I'd have to say, that even though, yeah, I think I'm more aware of the tools and what I need to do, it's still an effort day to day to keep direction. And, and there's different factors, and we'll talk about why that is, but it's an effort. I'm not saying it's not worth the effort, but it's, it's, it's a challenge day to day. So that's what we're talking about. So guiding one's life, making the right choices, because ultimately these choices have to come from us. <coughs> Those choices, when we listen to ourselves, in other words, we can say we listen to our intuition, what to eat, what not to eat, what activity to choose, etc. Those things, when we make those better choices, then yes, our health gets better. It's not complicated. It's really learning how to listen to ourselves and, and choose, make the right choices. That's really it, what it comes down to. You know? Choosing this over that or like that. Number two in this definition, a system of principles and practices of harmony to benefit the body, mind, and planet. So a system of principles and practices of harmony to benefit body, mind, and planet. There is no separation between body and mind. 
you know? Our emotions are all related to the condition of our organs and our blood. So they're, they're not separate. As people get healthier, as people's blood quality gets stronger, that just naturally gets more stable. That comes, right? That comes together, there's no separation. And of course, our actions of what we, what we eat, how we live our life, of course, influences the planet as well. There's no separation, everything's connected. So I wanted to share that with you first, this definition, and a couple other things I'll say. Some of you may have heard of um, Hippocrates. Remember that name? Uh -huh. Father of modern Western medicine. He was really the first person to use the word macrobiotic to describe a way of living and life that is all interconnected in how we align with the environment. How do we eat and live in a way that nature supports us, not separate? Right? So for me, macrobiotic means looking at all the aspects that go into creating health and a dynamic life. One aspect is food, but it's one aspect. There's many other aspects that go into creating our, a healthy life, quite frankly. It's one. It's an important one, but it's one. There's other things that do that, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so I hope that's enough, but that's the essence, macrobiotic. Big or large, great life. And, and the goal of macrobiotics, I'd have to say, is freedom. Freedom. Having the health and the vitality to do what you want to do in your life. That's it. For me, it's not really a diet, even though you can look at food, but really it's more about how we see our life itself. And I remember, and I've shared this before, that my teacher, Mr. Kushi, K-U-S-H-I, one of the most important things he asked us was, what's your dream? What's your passion in your life? And basically he would say, eat for your dream. Eat for your passion. And I found over the years that people that are able to do that and put that in perspective for what food is, as delicious as it is and as wonderful as it is, and as exciting as we can get over chocolate chip cookies, when all is said and done, it's really, why are we here? What are we doing? And so freedom means having the health to do it. If we don't have the energy, we don't have the health, we're slaves. We're not free. So that's, for me, what it's really what it's about. But it's not about ball and chain, uh, rigid, being stuck. It's actually choice and deciding what we want. Okay. I want to review something uh, briefly, and then we'll, we'll move forward into diagnosis. So the factors that determine our condition, okay, the, what can, determines our condition are the following, just so that we're on the same page with this. Number one is our diet and eating habits. Okay? Our diet and eating habits, more than anything, influence our condition. You can eat the best quality food, but you eat it in such a chaotic way, you will not get any benefit, and I promise you that. I promise you that. I've seen that for many years now. It's a mistake many people make. I eat organic, I eat vegan, but people eat standing up, eating late at night, not chewing food, multitasking eating, I, I can go on and on and on. Like I haven't done that myself? We all have. But this is the part, the eating habits, that often is pushed aside. And also, for many of us, gets very difficult in modern life because we're very busy. The challenge of creating health in modern life is how do you balance modern life, given how busy most people are? And that's usually what gets sloppy. That's what gets sloppy. Years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the pace of life wasn't as nutty as it is now. And so there was a regularity and an order. And macrobiotics is really, really, how do you bring that back? How do you bring back that orderliness that needs to be there for health? Because most of our body functions rely on order and having a structure. Some people will rebel against that. Oh, don't tell me what to do. I want to eat what I want to eat. And, but the, the truth is that with order and structure comes freedom. So, Eating habits basically influence what benefit or not you get from the food. The other aspect I want to say about the, with diet here is how much food, so the quantity. I'm doing a lecture, by the way, overeating, how and why to eat less. Don't miss that. That's a biggie. We'll all practice overeating at that lecture. <laughs> the quality of our food, so the quality of our food influences it. 
quantity changes quality. Overeating good food, the quality is not the same anymore. Yeah, that's a bummer, huh? Yeah. Tell me about it, especially us that like to eat. And then also the other aspect is proper cooking. So hopefully you know how to cook well. Because if you don't know how to cook well, then you're going to make good food not good food. You destroy the benefits. And yes, there's eating some raw and there's eating cooked, but you need to know how to cook properly so that you enhance the nutrition from the food. That's very important. Many people don't know how to cook properly. And many people don't know how to cook to make the food very delicious, which is also very important. Because cooking should make the food bring out the nutritious quality and make it delicious tasting. Okay? Eating habits I mentioned. Lifestyle factors are meals regular. Right? Again, about late night eating. Exercise influences our condition. Exercise is food. So the exercise we choose should bring us to balance, not make us more imbalanced. Many people choose the wrong exercise. Yeah. Say it again. Exercise is food. It's a type of food exercise. It should bring us to balance, not make us more imbalanced. Often people choose activity as incorrectly as food. So you need to ask, what kind of activity do I need? Do I need more physical activity? Do I need to be more mentally stimulated? Do I need maybe a power yoga or more gentle yoga? Do I need to be jogging 10 miles a day or maybe I'm just taking a walk? Is it perpetuating my imbalance? or is it returning me back? That's what exercise is. Okay? Our home environment influences our condition. This is the beginning of spring, by the way. So this is February, what is today, 16th? So it should, you know, officially spring begins February 4th. Now some of you living in a cold climate, like myself in Boston, thinking this guy's nuts. Probably snowing back home. But early February is the start of spring rising. And so adjustments for the spring actually start six weeks before the start of the season. Yeah. So in my liver class, we're going to talk more about that because this is liver time. This is the time of the year when liver symptoms definitely come out more. So if you're angry with me or whatever, I won't take it personally. <laughs> I got it. You can discharge that anger. Our home environment, it's our recharging station. If your home is cluttered, if it's disorderly, if there's stuff all over the place, that affects you, and that affects your condition. There's no one can deny how good that feels when you have a nice, clean, orderly space. You get that stuff out, you move it on, right? Agreed? So I mean, no denying that. Clutter basically makes more pressure inside. That makes you more pressured, especially when you can't find things that you want to find. I told my story, I think, last year, how I couldn't find this important paper for a lecture, and I spent almost the whole night looking for it. I don't know if any of you heard that. No. Almost the whole night, my wife sees me in the morning and goes, did you sleep? I'm like, no, I couldn't find that cotton-picking paper. You know what she said? Here it is. Here it is. It was on the other, other table. I spent, like, the whole night looking for it. But that was because my office was such a, like, a bomb headed. Right? Our external environment influences our condition where you live. So the cold, is it cold, is it hot? What's the altitude like? So you can change that, yes, by moving. You could, you can say, okay, I can't take Florida anymore. I'm moving to Boston. Or I can't take Boston anymore, I'm moving to, I don't know. I want to go to Alaska, even colder, whatever. <laughs> but our external environment does influence our, our cravings, what, what goes on. So. We'd have to move to change that. Our work influences our condition, your work. Does it fulfill you? Does your work actually bring out your true nature? No. Does it actually support who you are, or is it simply to pay a bill? Pay a bill. So yes, there's the reality of, of making a living and paying bills, but when all is said and done, what's most important is that we're trying to find some kind of work or what we're doing in our life that actually nourishes us. Many people get sick because they're doing things that are simply making them sick. Yeah, that's right. I've had people tell me on health forums, 
this job is killing me, I can't stand it, the only gets, gets, the thing that gets me through the day is my box of Godiva, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It should nourish who you are and bring out your true nature. Very important. That's one of the hardest things to create. Learning how to cook brown rice and vegetables, that's the easy part. Working on creating a fulfilling life and having that nourishment, that's more difficult. But that influences tremendously. Maybe you are doing the right type of work, but are doing it the wrong way. Right? I mean, I'll share something with you honestly. So I was home for six weeks, from mid-December to the end of January, up till February 2nd. That was the first six weeks I was home in 17 years. Yeah, even though it was to do with myself. It was incredible. It was actually incredible. I got on that flight that Friday morning, February 2nd, to Chicago. I got up at 4 in the morning, as I usually have to do. And I said to myself, what the bleep I won't do, are you doing? Because I, I, I forgot what it was actually like to keep going at 4 in the morning, overnight flights back from Seattle and LA. You get on this kind of, you know, merry-go-round with it. And it was, it was incredible to be able to have that kind of break. So of course, it, it you know, got me to start thinking about, OK, what do I want to do in the future and move forward? Not that I don't want to travel at all, but how to create a little better balance. Yeah, it was amazing to be home like that. Our relationships influence our condition. If you're around negative people all the time that put down your broccoli, <laughs> Ew, what's that? I wouldn't give it to my dog. You need to be aligned with people that encourage health and support you and push you a little bit to be healthier. It doesn't mean that you can't have people in your life that maybe are negative, but you also have to be able to align with health conscious people. As you're aligning with health conscious people, naturally your health gets better. As you're aligning with people that are more negative, naturally that brings you down. Uh, it's just a piece of cake. Look, you eat so well. Let's go get Ben and Jerry's and a fudge cake. You're fine. Instead of, did you do your body rub today? Oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah, let's do it. We need that support. Lots of people are isolated in trying to create health, and that's very challenging. Right? So it, it, we need support that way. And last but not least, what creates our view of life is our condition. Our, uh, what creates our condition is our view of life. Is the glass half empty or half full? How do we see it? What's the blinders that we put on our, ourselves or not? If we have a bigger, broader vision of things, naturally we release pressure. So ultimately, what we're doing in, in balancing our life day to day is. Balancing these factors. This is our condition. Okay? When we talk about diagnosis, what we're talking about very simply is direction. Okay? Direction. Being able to see the direction our health is going in. Okay? It's not based on necessarily a medical test, not that I'm opposed to that, but it's actually based on how we see our health and the ability to see it. The truth is that we're able to see many health problems much sooner than when they're a real problem, if we know the signs along the way. And that's what this, we're going to talk about today. Diagnosis is seeing direction. And then if it's something that's not good, what we're seeing, how do we change it? How do we move in a good direction? It's simply that. Okay? And in direct in health, it's simply taking one step at a time, moving the right way, that's all. It's really what it is, okay? And then we're able to make those adjustments day in and day out. So, the first type of diagnosis is actually the one that's most important. Unfortunately, that as human beings, we're not born with a handbook. Did you have a handbook when you were born? Did, were you given one when you came out? A uh, mm -hmm. handbook, guidebook to human being? Uh, I wasn't. Okay. But it'd be nice if we had one. This one I'm going to give to you is kind of like the guidebook. So I know you may be like a little, you know, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever we are here. So anyway, better late than never for the guidebook. Here it is. Ready? Okay. The most important diagnosis is daily self-diagnosis. 
daily self-diagnosis. And we're going to go through these. These are a bunch of points. These are things you can ask yourself about what you see day to day or not. See, a lot of people say, oh, I'm healthy. I feel great. But the truth is that there's things that one can see that say, mm, not quite right. Both symptom-wise, things that are going on in the body, and then visually that you can see. So number one, okay? Could I fall asleep easily last night? That's your first question. Could I fall asleep easily last night? That shows the, that shows the balance between activity and diet. That shows the balance between activity and diet. Could I fall asleep easily? So what it is is to call the magic triangle. Sleep, diet, or we can say appetite, and activity. Very simply, it works like this. It's very simple. Okay? If you don't sleep well, then you'll eat things and drink things you normally wouldn't because you're tired. Okay? If we overeat, we don't sleep well. Okay? If you overeat, it's hard to be physically or mentally active. You can't be sharp. It's very hard to be sharp. Okay? If you're overactive physically, then you end up overeating often. You crave more food. That's why for people trying to lose weight, the key is not to do so much activity. The key is consistent, regular activity in a modest, moderate amount of activity. Because too much activity will make you hungrier. Okay? If you're mentally too active, especially at night, it's hard to settle down to sleep. Okay? If you don't sleep well, it's hard to be active. They play off each other. That's called the magic triangle. Okay? So number one, could I fall asleep? Number two, did I sleep through the night undisturbed? Did I sleep through the night undisturbed? What does that show? It shows orderly daily pattern in our life. It often shows is an imbalance from pressure. It's an imbalance or pressure from things that contract us. So here's I'm gonna, a distinction I'm going to make for you that you can add to being vegan or eating vegetarian, and it was very unique in macrobiotics. So we don't just look at the nutrition of the food. We look at the energetics of it, meaning does it have a constricting effect? Literally do this to us. Or does it have an overly expanding effect? Overly constricting maybe things like too much salt, too, many, too much popcorn like last night on deck 14, or chips. None of us had that. Too many baked things or burnt things, was it? they have a constricting effect, literally contracting. Our bodies expand and contract. I mean, I don't realize that in your life, but they do. Our liver can expand and contract. Our kidneys can contract and expand. That's the yin and yang of it, without getting too esoteric, whatever. But that's, and food can do, do that as well. Many of us can relate to, if you ever had a, a drink, then your brain cells expand and you're really relaxed. That's yin. <coughs> Maybe you get into too much salt or dry things and it tightens you up like that. <coughs> Most of us play back and forth with that in our life without even realizing it. But it's actually very important to have an understanding of it. So looking at food, you need to look at it two ways. Not just that it's vegan, that's great. But is it contracting? Because the Vegan sausage has 500 milligrams of sodium per one link. Hello? Or is it expanding? Because it's cashew cream loaded with maple syrup. Yahoo! That's the yin and yang of it. Very important to know that. So if you're not aware of that, please try to think a little bit more this way. Because my experience of years, this is my 15th year on this cruise. I've seen many, many, many people for counseling and, and guidance. When people are able to add that component to what they're doing, it changes many things. Just something looking at something calorically is not enough. Just because something is a good source of B12 is not enough. You have to combine the two. And that's a, a wonderful gift, I think, with macrobiotics. Okay? So, 
Not sleeping through the night shows an imbalance from pressure. Okay? Because at night our organs contract. Our organs contract at night. Okay? And if they're overly contracted already, they tighten up more and you wake up. What especially does that? The liver, especially between, I'd say, 11 to 3 in the morning, but especially 1 to 3, and the kidneys. So a lot of urination at night comes from over-contraction. To stay horizontal, you need to make your condition more relaxed inside. And men, yes, that means the prostate. Because the prostate is a small, a small walnut-sized gland that's already compact already, then gets more compact, and up you go. Okay? Hope that makes some sense. Okay? So, too much liquid could prevent us from settling down because liquid creates rising, separating energy. So for some people, the inability to settle down is from too much liquid in the evening. Drinking too much, not just alcohol, water, tea, whatever have you, okay? As I said, baked things, hard, roasted, toasted, dry, blackened, burnt, scorched, barbecued. You got the idea? Yeah. Like that, okay? They all do that, okay? And for people eating animal food, yes, even more so, because most animal food is contracting. The other thing that will do that is things that are too cold. So ice, cold things, and ice. So mm. I'm not saying to warm up your coconut bliss ice cream, whatever night that is this week, but anyway, <laughs> be aware of it. And the other thing that makes pressure inside uh, that gets people up is overeating. That's another thing. Oh, the effect of overeating makes pressure. And that will also wake you up at night. Okay? Number three. So that was number two. Number three. Could I wake easily with a clear head in the morning? Could I wake away could I wake up easily with a clear head in the morning? Okay? Again, this is daily self-diagnosis. This is before any other diagnosis. This is number one. In the beginning, you may need to have a checklist in your in your wall or something. And then over time, these things naturally you're just aware of. I don't, I don't have a list on my, in my uh, bathroom. Okay, let's go through the list, Warren. One, two, three, four. I'm just, a, you become aware of it in your body. Hmm, can't get up this morning. Feel like a truck ran me over. Hmm, what, what is that? Like that. Oh, got up to pee last night like, three times. Could it have been the Frito-Lay corn chips? Nah, it couldn't have been that. Like that, okay? If we have low blood sugar, if hypoglycemic, then we can't wake up with a clear head in the morning. So if our blood sugar is too low, then we can't wake up. You get up and you have cloudy thinking, you have a little fog, you like that. Blood sugar starts to rise at about 2 a.m. At about 2 in the morning, our blood sugar starts to rise as the body starts to get up then. Yeah. So with hypoglycemia, our blood sugar doesn't rise like it should. And then we wake up when we're tired. Okay? Number four. How quickly could I get going in the morning? How quickly can you get going? Like a child. Should be completely alert, up, out, no coffee, no Starbucks, no Dunkin' Donuts, you're good to go. You slept well, your body is clean, your charge is good. That's what normal getting up in the morning is. Yep, that's right. If we're not overeating and we have good blood sugar, then we get up easily, no problem, okay? Amount of sleep needed, that depends on how long it takes our body to clean and repair itself and the autonomic nervous system to recharge. My observation is that people get, as people get healthier, not overeating, not eating too many expansive things, sugar, lots of sweets, alcohol, our body cleans and repairs more quickly, and you need less sleep. Yeah, you need less sleep. Right? Overeating, again, makes you more tired. Number five, urination. Number of times and color. So urination, number of times and color. First of all, that shows recent diet and activity within the last few days. Healthy number of times urinating is about three to five times a day. That's not 35 times a day. That's three <laughs> to five times a day. And yes, men naturally, it's normal to urinate more. 
than women. Right? Color, light beer. We call it new gold, new gold. If you have Guinness stout, there's a urologist right outside the door, please excuse yourself. So, if it's too pale, that usually means if it's too light, not enough minerals. It could be, it could be a lack of minerals or too much drinking, over, over drinking, too much liquid. There's such a thing as over drinking where you start to pee out minerals. Yeah. So our, our really mineral, minerals and liquid should come from our food. Right? We, yes, we can drink some, but when we're drink, when we're peeing that much, that's not good. Nighttime urination is not normal. No, it's not normal. Not normal to get up to urinate at night. When the weather's cold or it's damp, yes, we urinate more. We're influenced by the cold because that contracts the kidneys. In fact, when the weather gets cold, our bodies contract. We get rid of some liquid, and that keeps us warmer. So that's natural. All right. So. That's the case. Lauren? Yeah. What is a healthy amount of water you're drinking a day? Let me get to that one. Okay. Okay? I'm gonna, but ask me that after. I'll leave time for questions. Number six, did I have a bowel movement this morning? Okay? Before eating and drinking. Tonight is my straight bowel talk. I'll go into much more depth. Everything you want to know about the poop in there, 8.30 tonight, be there. Basically, it shows what, have you been, what you've been eating in the last few days to week. Last few days to a week. But that should be the first thing in the morning when we get up. The time that really we should go is really between 5 and 7 a.m. That's why I recommend most people get up by 7. Because the, the, the large intestine, the colon, is most active at that time. That's why for people that want to improve their digestion, get up early. The worst thing you can do is sleep in late. That makes your bowels even more sluggish. Getting up at 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock, so earlier better. So it shows our lifestyle and eating habits. Lifestyle and eating habits are bowels. Color, we call it the golden banana. Golden banana. Unbroken, no odor, floats a little bit before it sinks. Sorry, just after lunch, but someone's got to talk about it. Bad, no bad odor. If it is a bad odor, that means putrefaction. Right? So it's putrefied. If the color is dark or hard, it's hard, like rabbit pellets, that means inside getting too, this yang stuff, too contracted. Many people notice a huge difference when they get off of dry things, the crackers, the rice cakes, the popcorn, the toast. Very different than those. Too much salt and sometimes a lack of light, fresh vegetable dishes. Not just raw salads, steamed, blanched, sauteed. It also can be for people that are transitioning to plant-based foods, it can be a discharge of animal food. So the dark color can be a discharge. You're getting rid of that animal food. That's a good sign. That's not bad. If the, the bowel movement itself is, is very large, or like fat, wide, that usually shows the digestive, digestive system is too loose and expanded. So it's swollen in the whole digestive system. That's not normal, okay? Usually it's from too much, we say, too much yin, things that create expansion. And very often tropical fruits will do that. Bananas and pineapples and mangoes, too much of that will expand the digestive system. The color green, if it's green, it's showing an overly acidic condition. So it's overly acidic. Okay? And usually coming from too much of the contracting things, too much yang. Okay? Number seven, did I feel strong and energetic today? Do you feel strong and energetic today? That shows a good balance in your meals. So if we feel strong and energetic, that shows a good balance in your meals. And it also shows that the quantity of food is right, is good. Most of us know that as soon as we do the, overdo the quantity, our energy goes down. Most of us, I think, are aware of when the, the amount is modest, our energy is better. The only time it's not is that if we're not absorbing well or our blood sugar simply is not stable yet. We're still dealing with low blood sugar. Okay? If we feel tired and weak without eating, 
it usually means that we've been overeating too much in the past because we should actually feel strong. Number eight, do I feel light and flexible? Do I feel light and flexible? That's the natural feeling in a human being. If not, it's often, over, again, overeating. Overeating, we lose our flexibility. And too many extremes in the, body, in the diet. Of, we say the yin things and yang things makes us stiff. How does my food taste today? How does your food taste today? If simple food tastes delicious, that oatmeal with nothing on it tastes so good, that's a good sign. Once you start having to add more and more sweeteners to things, more and more taste, more and more salt, that shows your appetite's not good. No. You should be like, almost like a person who hasn't eaten in a week, then all of a sudden has a nice bowl of steel-cut oats, plain. It's the best thing they've ever had in their life. Being good and hungry is the most important thing for strong health. To have a good appetite for simple food. The modern diet, with all the refined sugars, all the salt, all the preservatives, all the additives, has spoiled people's taste buds. The most important thing to reestablish for good health and to feel fantastic is to have a simple taste for simple foods. Yeah, that's a, a most important thing. So how did your food taste today? If we're tired, delicious things don't taste delicious. Right? If we're tired, simple, th simple things don't taste delicious. Right? So it shows, when it doesn't taste good, that our digestion and circulation is off. So again, as people get healthier, simple food tastes delicious. It's great. Then the problem is how not to overeat. If you can't decide what to eat, that usually means we went too long without eating, or we're too, too full, or too tired. That's why even when you're cooking, the best thing is not to pick and eat when you're cooking. To cook when you're a little hungry. Because that's when your best food is going to be made, when you're a little hungry. You cook with an appetite. Yeah. Okay. Number 10. Is my mind clear today and I can I recall things easily? Is my mind clear? That's a barometer of health. Memory and clarity is becoming more of an issue for many, many people. What it shows is strong blood quality. So when this is clear and sharp, that shows that our blood quality is good, and it also shows that our digestion is strong. That's a natural outcome. Mental clarity, focus, concentration gets better as digestion gets better and blood quality gets stronger. Yeah. Am I calm and patient? Number 11. Calm and patient. Well, that's a problem in society. That shows blood quality and especially the condition of our liver. Our liver. And blood sugar. Patience is a sign of a healthy, happy liver. Okay? Number 12. Did I sit down today to regular meals at regular times, eating undisturbed? I'll say that again. Did I sit down to eat regular meals, eating undisturbed? Just eating. I don't see anybody here in the dining room checking their emails at the tables. Yeah. See anybody? You saw some? Oh, I didn't. Got a rat on them. <laughs> eating is just eating. You eat. You take 20 minutes and you eat. When this is going and active, this doesn't absorb as well. When we cannot sit and eat, it usually shows that there's an imbalance in our pancreas, which relates to the midbrain, and or there's an imbalance in the intestines as well. So our ability to sit down we have to relax ourselves to sit down. So eating should just be taking the 20, 25 minutes and actually having our food. Then digestion is going to be its strongest. Okay? When we can't do that, it usually means we're too pressured inside. And also it means not working in our head while we're eating. And that's the hardest thing for a lot of people. Not working in your head while you're eating. Yeah. Being able just to quiet it down. 
quiet conversation, what's going on in the tables. I haven't heard any, you know, rowdy conversations yet, but who knows? You're not vegan? I'm like, you eat gluten? So maybe that's going to come up. Right? Who knows? <laughs> quiet conversation makes our condition more open. It actually relaxes us more. It helps balance our condition when we eat with other people. Number 13. Did I have a grain or grain product with each meal? Did I have a grain or grain product and at least a vegetable dish with every meal? Grain only, a bowl of oatmeal and no, no vegetable, we, get, we start to get more young. So really, not to be critical, but this morning, yes, we need to, or it may get the opposite, just too loose and expanded. If our condition gets too tight, then energy can't move, we get stuck. In fact, we have a hard time even discharging or getting rid of things from the past. We can get too tight from too much, maybe, activity. It can come from too much salt or dry things. Too many foods that literally do this. Even the effect of overeating over time makes pressure inside. And so what happens is people get tight and actually too full. I'm not talking about full after a meal full. I'm talking about one's, over, one's condition is just too full. A healthy person where they feel their best is when they feel a little empty inside. Valentine's Day was just a couple days ago. So you can have a vase with two dozen roses. It could be a small vase and it's pretty stuffed. Or you can have that vase with maybe five or six roses, where there's some circulation. And I will tell you, and I'm not a florist, but I'll tell you right now, the vase that has the six roses in there is actually going to do better than the two dozen, because there's natural circulation and movement. It's no different than in this room, if we packed in another 150 people in this room, it wouldn't feel comfortable. It would be too full. Or if there's only three of you in this room and I'm trying to give a lecture to three or four, it's too empty. The energy can't and then it gets dark. So if our condition stays too tight, we get dark. If the condition is too loose, it can't gather, it gets dark. You, do you follow me? Okay. Then, Tight, loose, empty, full. Some people need more nourishment. Some people a little depleted. Majority of people, though, too full. Too full happens from overeating, which there's many causes of that. One of them happens to be just too pressured inside. And I'll talk about this more at the overeating lecture, that one of the things that people do first and try to release pressure is just to eat more, to relax. If you can make your condition more relaxed inside, it's easier not to overeat. And you get more and more comfortable keeping a little empty. Yeah. Everybody feels a little bit more comfortable when they're a little bit more empty inside. Absolutely. I'll talk about that more overeating. So, Empty, you don't see as much. You do. That's more you see that in third world countries, or people where there's just not enough. There's poverty. There's empty. And it's very interesting because when you get to the point of really over empty, the belly expands. It goes the opposite. And then the belly gets tight and hard. So everything at its extreme changes to the opposite. Okay? And then last but not least, fast or slow. So is the person's condition, are they moving too fast? Literally, they can't settle down? Or do you need to shake them up to get them going because they're moving so slow? So, or is there a balance between? So in diagnosis, these four questions, bright or dark, tight or loose, empty or full, fast or slow. That's what's called comprehensive diagnosis. There's many different types of diagnosis. There's voice diagnosis. Our voice radiates the condition of different organs. There's a kidney voice, a lung voice, a pancreas voice, a liver voice. 
There's handwriting diagnosis. There's pulse diagnosis. Many. But most important, the first one I showed you, and then this. Okay? Number three. Uh, comprehensive. Okay. The outside of the body is a reflection of the inside. Okay? The part shows the whole. Diagnosis, the ability to do that, the ability to see the inside from the outside, is based on the basic pattern of all of life, and that's the spiral. The uniqueness of the spiral is that the center and the periphery are one. The center and the periphery are one. They're not disconnected. And if you open this up, this is a wave. There's no separation. So, in diagnosis, there's iridology, right? Again, the pulse. Everything on the inside is shown outside if you know where to look for it. So, this last part, we're going to talk a little bit in terms of how we see this and what this is about. Is this accurate? Yes, incredibly so. Yeah. How do I know? Observation. When I started sitting in consultations with Mr. Kushi for a while, I often wonder, and I did say to him, where did you see that? And then he'd say to me, you didn't see that? I said, no, that's why I'm asking. Where did you see that? Good luck. Just wait. He, I mean, every now and then he'd toss me a bone, you know. But most of the time, no. And that's why he liked me, because I didn't bother him. But over time, if you see enough noses and enough under eyes and enough chin areas, and you start to see common patterns. Go, oh, yeah, I said that. Oh, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. So you can see it. Okay? So let's talk about this. So when we talk about diagnosis, what are you looking for? So, bless you. You're looking for, number one, are there areas that are swollen? So are there swollen areas on the face? Is it puffy? Is it tight or contracted? Now, what's interesting, a lot of people are getting work on their face cosmetically. So someone asked me recently, Warren, with all the cosmetic surgery being done, is your diagnosis so accurate? You know, I just had a nose job, this job, that job. How do you know? You know, I don't even have a real face. It doesn't work. <laughs> that was out in California. So, but the good thing is you can see other, use other areas to see the same thing. And I'm going to show you that. So just because maybe one area may be fixed up, the other area, unless they change that too, but you can still see that. Okay? So is it puffy or tight or contracted? Are there skin blemishes? Where are the skin blemishes? Okay? Eruptions, moles, warts, pimples, discoloration, skin tags. Wherever they are, it's showing what is going on in that organ or in that area. Okay? Something is trying to discharge out. Is the color, what's the color? Is it red? Is it yellow? Is it white, purple, green, black? So we'll talk about that now. Okay? Question is, what's normal? As I said, normal is bright and fresh. Bright and fresh. And clear. And if you don't believe that's the case, get a picture taken of yourself, develop it, put it in an envelope, and then eat well and take care of yourself. And then look at that good picture, a nice close-up, five, six months from now, and you'll notice something. I promise you that. OK, let's look at this. So let's start with this first, the mouth. OK, the mouth. The mouth is the entrance to the digestive system. That's the beginning of the digestive system, and that's the end. OK? So where's the end? There's the end, back here. That's the end. Sorry, that's the end. Okay? So the top lip shows the stomach, and the bottom lip shows the colon. The top lip shows the condition of the stomach. The bottom lip is the also called the large intestine. 
what you're looking for first with this is that the top lip and the bottom lip vertically should be even. In other words, the mouth, that's the problem with him. Let me see if I can draw on here. Yeah, so the mouth. It's even, okay? When this is much more swollen than the top lip, that's showing that the large intestine itself is loose or expanded. They should be more even, okay? More even. The color, when it starts to get like a white band through the lip, the bottom, a white band, that's showing that circulation through the intestines is not strong. When the bottom lip also gets a little whitish or patches, it also shows a low level anemia. The bottom lip corresponds to the nail beds. When the nail beds get all white and lose their pink color, it shows, can show an anemic condition, that circulation is not good, that our blood quality is weak. And you see that in the bottom lip as well. Okay? Dry chap lips show dryness in the intestines. So where it's drying out. That's not to say we're not influenced by the environment or cold weather. Absolutely, we are. We are. Regardless if that can affect us. But that shows what's going on here. When it gets purplish in color, or very red or purple, it shows inflammation in the intestines. So it's inflamed. Conditions like colitis or Crohn's or irritable bowel can show up in the bottom lip especially or constantly wet, especially if it's, there's diarrhea or loose bowels. Okay? Sometimes vertical lines um, in the uh, intestines, uh, in the bottom lip, vertical lines going down. That usually shows, especially for women, that hormonal balance is off, a drying out of hormones. Vertical lines on the bottom lip. Yeah. Okay? The bottom lip can be divided into three sections. So the right side, ascending colon, center part, transverse, third part, descending. Ascending, transverse, descending. So ascending, transverse, descending. So. One area may be more swollen or something breaking out on the bottom lip. Some kind of uh, irritation shows where in the intestines, which part is affected. And also the, the continuity of it. What's that? Yeah. Cold saw is so acidity. Top lip is the stomach. So the corners of the mouth show the duodenum or duodenum. So uh, chapped in the corner. You know, splitting usually shows too much oil or fatty things, too many nuts, too many nut butters. One side also shows too much sweets, too much sugar and sweets. So the corners of the mouth, duodenum, okay? Top lip, stomach. So it's interesting, you know, when people put uh, piercing in the bottom lip, when it's pierced, it's kind of like 24-7 acupuncture to the colon. Constant stimulation is what it is. Anytime that something is pierced, it means it's being stimulated constantly, 24-7. Yeah. So besides the top lip and the bottom lip being even, what's happening is many people, the mouth is getting more swollen or expanded. And that actually is showing a loosening or weakening of the whole digestive system. The digestive system gets loose and expanded from too many foods that literally create expansion. And that's the beginning out of it. So again, tropical fruits. For some people, too much raw salad, too much raw, especially if the intestines are already loose or weak. Right? Too many cold things. Too many milks, like imitation milk, soy milk, almond milk, oat milk. Too many smoothies. Those things can weaken the, the intestines too much. Okay. So, the mouth. Okay. Yeah. The uh, area above here, so here. So the area between the eyebrows, the liver, the liver. So this area relates to the liver. 
What you see first appearing when we're 12, 13 years old, around adolescence, it starts to get oily, and then maybe pimples start to appear. We put some clearasil on it or whatever. Back then it was that. What are they using now? Proactive or something? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's showing that there's too much oil and fats building up in the liver. When that's not addressed, then over time what happens, lines start to form. Lines. So first more, these lines going up, usually two lines, is not as serious as one deep crevice. So what it's showing when the lines forming is that the liver is overworking. Often from overeating, late night eating, too many baked foods, dry flour products, too many other things, oil, too many things that burden the liver. It can come from medications and drugs, but basically the lines are showing the condition of the liver. Okay? One deep line is more serious than two of them. Okay? And you also see, again, this area getting more oily, breaking out. For men, what's significant is that above the eyebrows, this area with, with prostate issues, which, which relates to the liver as well, often gets swollen. So the area here, do you remember like um, Frankenstein and Herman Munster had a big, big ridge here? Yeah. So that's a sign of liver trouble and, and, and potential anger and irritability. Where you see that connection is the large toe. So the liver meridian runs from the inside of the large toe up through the prostate. So the liver, basically, meridian runs through the prostate and the cervix and the reproductive organs for men and women. So all reproductive issues are liver-related. What you see, especially with men, is one, usually, of the toenails gets really funky. It's either it gets um, broken, uh, chipped, it's, it doesn't look clean, it maybe gets yellowish, because the toenails are influenced by the liver. Fingernails are influenced by our kidneys. So the large toes show the liver condition. And often what happens, one of the toes gets more swollen this way, across from the liver, gets swollen. So if you compare your right and left toe, the large toes, you often see one of them is more swollen than the other. And often it's the right one, because the liver is on the right side of the body. Okay? So that's where you see the condition of the liver. Okay? Next. Underneath the eyes, right below it, is where you see the condition of the kidneys, our kidney function, the kidneys. Okay? And I think I'm also doing a kidney talk, too, this, this week. Right? So once you see under the eyes, number one, it starts to get dark. It starts to get dark. That's the most common. It doesn't look clear and fresh. Darkness basically shows that circulation through the kidneys is not active. Okay? Often what happens is the kidneys get very tight and contracted. The things that affect the kidneys more than anything is too much poor quality salt, especially restaurant food salt. That's the hardest part of eating out, is the amount of salt that's being used. How much salt and the quality of it. So kosher salt, regular commercial refined salt, is terrible for the kidneys, and especially when there's too much of it. Okay? Because regular salt is much drier and harsher than good sea salt. So I do believe in using very modest amounts of sea salt in cooking, in cooking to bring out a nice delicious taste of the food, but not excessive where it's the point where it's making trouble with the kidneys or making us have strong cravings. The other thing that affects the kidneys that makes that darkness is too much cold. Ice cold drinks, anything frozen. Okay. So enjoy the coconut bliss while we're here, but cold as well. Oh, that pink Himalayan salt. Pink Himalayan, I think, is still a little stronger than what I like. I like a, a, a salt called S-I sea salt. S-I sea salt. S-I sea salt. It's, it's much milder. The letters, S's and Sam, I's. S, I, yeah. Under the eye, so besides the darkness, and again, what that's showing is that circulation is not good. Then you sometimes see bags. Bags under the eyes. There's two types of bags. 
there's ones that are more hard and ones that are more soft. The hard bags are basically showing accumulation of protein and fat and literally hardening, going toward kidney stones. The soft bags are showing more fluid retention. And often what that corresponds with is ankles that are swollen. Ankles that are swollen and kidney, that's a kidney issue, swollen ankles and feet. Okay? So, air bag, uh, bags here. So, literally to the touch, it feels hard, and one is more soft. I joke about it, I talk about like luggage, like American tourister, and uh, you know, travel bra, or that was soft one. Yeah. Accumulation of protein and fat, and too much poor quality salt into that. The combination of poor quality salt and ice cold things harden inside, okay? So. When you see across here, the whole area getting dark, like a mask, like a, a raccoon, or a mask of Zorro, that's showing adrenal exhaustion. So that darkness through the whole area is the adrenals. Inside the eye here is where you see the adrenals, here and here. But, and when it gets dark, that's what, you know, that's what it shows. Pushing too much, running on coffee, losing sleep, but the whole area is adrenal exhaustion, okay? The area in the temples says spleen, right? The spleen, okay? The spleen is a very key player, especially for women's health, because the spleen is actually what activates menstruation every month, when a woman's menstruating in her life. So it actually turns it on like a faucet, the spleen. Many women are diagnosed with this damp or deficient spleen. It's like this weak spleen. It's a damp or deficient spleen. The spleen, energetically, we talk about it, how it distributes the energy of the food through the body. Okay? But it also, it runs through the reproductive organs. So where it is, the outside of the large toe, up through the inner leg, through the cervix, uterus region, is the spleen ring. So the spleen and liver, are the most important organs for woman's health. A lot of sweet cravings and sugar cravings and chocolate cravings are from an imbalance in the spleen. What you see diagnosis-wise is in the temples here. You see veins starting to appear, or like a little bluish green in this area, sometimes pimples in the area breaking out, sometimes it getting very sunken, that's here. You also can see in the large toe, calluses on the outside of the large toe, either foot, and especially the toe starting to hook in a lot towards the center. So instead of the toe being straight out, it starts to hook like that. That shows some very strong deep contraction in the spleen itself. And that relates then to blood sugar because the spleen is connected to the it's spleen, pancreas, stomach, related to blood sugar. So you see that here. That comes from a lot of, of ice cold, sweet things. So our whole craze with frappuccinos, cold frozen things, too many tropical fruit drinks, I'm sorry to say, but too many smoothies with bananas and all this tropical fruit, put some ice in it, take some frozen blueberries out of the fridge, blend it all up. If you really listen, listen, your spleen is saying, oh no, not again. <laughs> spleen does not do that, especially in the winter time. Not a good time. Cold affects the spleen worse in the cold weather. Yeah. You can get away with it a little bit more in the summertime, but cold is more detrimental in the wintertime. So that's a spleen imbalance. See that here, okay? The lower part of the mouth, okay. the lower part of the mouth, it says here sexual regions, or reproductive organs, so the bottom, the chin. That's for men and women. So this region, when it gets discolored from the rest of the face, is showing that there's some stagnation in the lower part of the body. So the chin area corresponds to the uterus, cervical region, and for men, the prostate. So what you see here sometimes is this area is dark, different color than the rest of the face. 
Sometimes what you see, especially when women are menstruating, breaking out here, blemishes, breaking out pimples, lower part of the chin area. The corners of this area, here and here, show the ovaries. This is where you see the ovaries, here and here. Okay? But the color here. For men, what happens is this area gets often red or looks uh, inflamed, like angry. That's the prostate is, is inflamed. And then, of course, I would check that with what's going on with the large toe, because that's liver related, so the chin. And sometimes what you also feel is it feels almost like there's hard cyst in the chin. It loses its softness. Sometimes you feel like some hardness when you're pressing here. That shows accumulation of fat in the reproductive area. It can also show fibroids, but some hardening. And where I look for that too, for you know, to, to confirm that, is the heel area relates to the reproductive organs. So when this Achilles tendon also is very swollen, that's also the reproductive area as well. That corresponds to that. So it's all connected. Okay? It's okay. The forehead itself, as you can see, right above the liver, it says the small intestine, and then it says large intestine, the colon. Okay? Small intestine, large intestine. With the forehead, what you're looking for, most importantly, is it clear? Is it clear? Does it look clear? Are there pimples? Are there dots, dots, spots here and there? It should look clear and fresh. When it's not, it's usually showing that there's some stagnation, whether it's small intestine or colon that's gathered in an area. Tonight, in the straight bowel talk, I'm going I'm to talk much more in depth about, about, those, about that area with the colon, because it's all about the digestive health. So the point is, again, this is a, a map. It's showing where in the body things are. As it starts to look fresher and clearer, it's basically showing that inside is changing. There's no separation with that. Yeah, that I can guarantee you. I've seen that for many years now. Yeah. The lines, will they go away from your liver? No. But they can, they can present themselves less. Yeah. This nose here, which shows the heart, yes. When it's overworked, it can get swollen and red. Can it get less swollen and less red? Absolutely. Former President Clinton, when he had that heart issues, this was bulbous and purple, and actually his nose changed, and I know he didn't get a nose job. So this changed as he went, I don't know, if he probably went back to being animal food again, but he went vegan for a while. You know, I know that for sure he did. I don't know, maybe he went back to Wendy's again. But anyway, this changed. So that shows the heart. So that can change. The outside's a reflection of the inside. It's pretty powerful. High blood pressure? Yes. It shows blood pressure and accumulation in the arteries. Yeah. So I want to leave a few minutes for um, questions here. The point is this. Health is a direction that we pursue one day at a time. For me, the, one, the most valuable thing is knowing how to see our health. It starts with day-to-day self-diagnosis. See, looking in the mirror, you know, not beating yourself up, but just noticing what you're seeing. And also notice what's going on daily with your basic, basic functions. That tells a lot. We don't wake up one day, we were healthy today, and tomorrow we're not. It, it just doesn't work like that. Over the years, I've had people say to me, why, I don't understand it. I've been as healthy as can be, and now I have cancer. It just doesn't work like that. There are signs along the way that something's not right. They, they just are. And those are very valuable tools to be able to see that. So anyway, I hope that gives some clarity. I wanted to leave a little time for questions. Yeah. Vertical lines or liver lines between the eyebrows. Yeah. Have you written a book or do you recommend books? I'm finally getting a cookbook out this year. I wanted to start with that. So, no, not with this. So you can, you can, no, not with this one. So you can, there's a book called um, Your Body Never Lies. Your Body Never Lies by Kushi, K-U-S-H-I. I don't know if they have it in the bookstore. They used, is it there? Yes. Right. A few copies, and they have a few in the face never lies. Your Body Never Lies, or if yeah. Is there another hand? Yeah. What about iodine? Iodine? What about it? Yeah, I mean, we get in macrobiotics, we get iodine from sea vegetables. 
So, yeah. That's my answer. The sea vegetables and the salad and the soup. Yeah. The miso soup, etc. Yeah. So the question is how much water a day? So here's, here's my question to you. Think about it. With the factors that are variables with, with, uh, about water, do you think it makes sense to drink X number of amount of water a day no matter what? No. It doesn't. Because the amount of water we need depends on our activity. It depends on the environment. It depends on what we're eating. It depends on how much we're urinating. So it's, right, so where I recommend to get liquid from, number one, is from food. Get your liquid at first. Drink comfortably. But when people have excessive thirst, usually it means there's too much salt or too many dry things or too many sweets that make us thirstier. We shouldn't have an insatiable, like, oh my god, I need more water, I need more water. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you're on your fifth glass of water, after like you just had an hors d'oeuvre, you're in trouble. So or when people are eating and drinking to, to get something down, that's not good for digestion. So it's very difficult for me to say, oh yeah, like drink eight to ten glasses of water a day. Do I just make an effort to drink? Absolutely. Am I aware when I'm on the plane that's so dry the environment I need more? Absolutely. But I'm also conscious of how much I'm going to the bathroom each day. And also the season. If I'm active playing tennis or sports, of course I need to drink more water. I would monitor it by how much you're urinating and the color and see from there. And then again, if you're having a plant-based diet and you're not overdoing dry things, salty things, baked things like that, you'll be good. Just get a, get a lot of your liquid coming from the food. Yeah? If you're urinating double what you've suggested is normal, uh, but you've kind of been that way your whole life, what's that mean? That's still a kidney issue. Yeah, that's a kidney issue. Again, either they're too contracted or not enough minerals, depending on the color. But that's still a kidney problem. It's been going on a long time now. Yeah. Yes. Einstein was confronted with time with a, one time with a busy desk, and he said, "You think this is busy? You ought to see it up here." <laughs> so my question is, then, what what is the best method of really quieting your mind? For me, the question is about quieting your mind. For, I can tell you what helps me. It's one, really one thing, being in nature. I make an effort every single day, regardless of how bad the weather is, and sometimes in Boston the weather's bad, believe me, and, and cold, dress up like Nanook of the North, and I'm out there. And for me, it just, it, 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 it settles me down. You can, I do some yoga, I've done a little meditation, but for me what helps me the most is getting outdoors. I'm not talking about walking in the city streets. I mean, that, if that's the best you can do, then do it. But especially in a park or in a quiet area. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk poop. <laughs> What's that? I'm going to talk about poop. Um, <laughs> if, um, all right, so you have a five o'clock poop, all right? It's great. But then you have several more through the day. Or if you have one and then you have it's normal and then it's loose, right, at the end. Is that yeah, it shows that the intestines are overly expanded. It shows a loose, the, the intestines is a loose digestive system. So and you need to, yeah, you need to strengthen that. And how many times a day is? Normal is really twice. Just twice? More than that, so we, I call it a type of diarrhea. Yeah. Normal is really twice. More than that often is overeating or a very loose digestive system. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. It should it should be clear in this clean air. Bluish, green, sometimes purple. Yeah. I, I think so. Question was in this area with the spleen, what's the color that's off? I said blue, green. Everybody, thank you for coming out.